Hello, everyone. I don't know whether it's good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you're at. I'd like to welcome you to our CBE online seminar seminars. I'm very happy that today we have Reverend Kionobu Kuohara, one of my favorite lecturers, speaking on Shakamuni to Shindan. And for those of you who don't know Kuohara Sensei's background, he's one of the most busiest of our Kaikyoshis because he runs the Jodo Shinshu International Office, and he's also the minister of the Berkeley Buddhist Temple, but he does so many other things. He is born and raised from Hiroshima, Japan, graduated from Hiroshima University, then he went to Ryukoku University and completed the PhD program there, and come, then came to the United States to the graduate Theological Union and IBS and graduated there. So he's one of our most highly educated Jodo Shinshu scholars. And we're very fortunate because his English is also very good. So we're fortunate to have him today. He's a very busy person. So I want to thank him for agreeing to take part in this seminar. And hopefully in the future, we'll have him for others. So please. Thank you, Hirano Sensei, uh, for a wonderful, nice, maybe too nice uh, introduction of uh, myself. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Yeah, so, it's almost 100 people on Zoom today. So, I really appreciate all of you joining this. Uh, uh, seminar. Yeah. So I really appreciate, you know, this opportunity, you know, receiving this opportunity to share the Dharma teaching of Shinran Shonin Jodo Shinshu with you. So uh, I don't know how much I can contribute to your like a development or expansion of your knowledge or appreciation. But anyway, I uh, do my best. You no. Know? And then, yeah, so so my anyway, uh, I think today I am going to talk about maybe 60 minutes and then uh, have a Q&A with you. But uh, so today's topic is, let me share my screen. I hope you can see the screen now, right? I don't know, we still call uh, sofa. Uh, sofa and Dr. Yeah. Uh, the seminar, uh, seminars online for all so far. I think CV used to call this uh, online program so far. So, yeah, uh, so today the topic I received or uh, share with you is uh, Shakamuni Buddha to Shinran Shoni. And then, ma, ano, so, ato, let me uh, post today's handout in the chat box. I just posted the file on the uh, chat box. So I will give my presentation showing the slide on the screen. But uh, of course, uh, you can download and then you know take a look at the uh, PDF file of my uh, slide on your uh, computer too. And then you could also refer to that file when you have a question. Yeah. So anyway, my uh, plan is to cover this huge topic in a very limited time. So you know, from Shakamuni Buddha and then Shinran Shoni. Right? So, Shakyamuni Buddha attained enlightenment. He became a Buddha about 2,500 or 2,600 years ago. Right? And then, uh, and then, so this teaching, I know there are many ways to describe what the Buddhism is, but uh, so this is a kind of life 
uh, or to live with Buddha's wisdom. And then there are many uh, styles, ways to live with, you know, this Dharma. So in the long history of Buddhism, we have a Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, right? So symbolically, this teaching is called like 84,000 Dharma gates. So the idea is there are many different you know, gates or entrances, but uh, all of us heading towards the same destination, right? Enlightenment, Buddhahood, or become a Buddha, right? So to reach, to get to that uh, destination, there are many different doors, gates you know, open. Right? And then depending on which gate we enter, right? We have a kind of different process different style of Buddhism, but we are one. We are same, you know, as a Buddhist aspiring for attaining Buddhahood. And then there are many, you know, different uh, uh, Buddhism. So I, and then, yeah, many of you follow or appreciate the teaching of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. So this is a uh, part of uh, Mahayana Buddhism, yeah? one uh, tradition, one of the traditions of Mahayana Buddhism. And then this is uh, like a pure and Buddhism, or maybe Japanese Buddhism, yeah? depending on how we kind of sort, categorize. Yeah, we can uh, describe Jodo Shinshu, you know, uh, putting that different category. Yeah? But the uh, Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, or sometimes we call it uh, Shin Buddhism. The founder is Shinran Shoni, or Venerable Shinran, who lived uh, 12th century in Japan. Shinran Shoni is the founder. And then almost you know, 800 years, yeah, we enjoy, appreciate this teaching. We receive great benefit from this teaching. And then next year, yeah, there is a big celebration at the Honganji, headquarters of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism in Kyoto. So to celebrate uh, Shinran Shonin's uh, 850th birthday, I'm sure we need a big birthday cake to put a lot of candles. And then also uh, another celebration is 800th of the uh, establishment of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. Yeah. So it's hard to kind of specify which year uh, Jodo Shin, so called Jodo Shinshu started. But institutionally, Jodo Shinshu started after Shinran Shonin passed away. Né? But uh, uh, like uh, more uh, uh, teaching wise, when Shinran Shonin completed the draft of Kyogyo Shinsho, né? his main work, that is the kind of uh, uh, the uh, start of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, né? which is uh, 1223. 23. So that's why 2023 is a kind of one big milestone or celebration of 800th anniversary of the establishment of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. So next year, uh, I'm sure, you know, BCA, Hawaii, Canada, you know, uh, South America and the European, you know, Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, we, you know, go to Japan and then join this big celebration. And if you are uh, interested in, please, yeah, join uh, this, uh, you know, wonderful yeah, tour to Japan. So then, Shakamuni Buddha, uh, he lived about 2,500 years ago in India. And then Shinran Shonin, 12th century in Japan. So time, uh, location, so big gap, right? But the Shinran Shonin as a serious seeker, eh, as a serious Buddhist, he appreciate the teaching, especially the teaching of Amida Buddha, delivered by Shakamuni Buddha. But the, to fill this gap, right, about the, you know, uh, 2000 year uh, history and then plus, and uh, uh, the geographical, you know, uh, distance, 
So that's why uh, we have uh, seven masters. And then there are many wonderful masters, great monks, nuns, you know, masters in the history of Buddhism. But the Shinran Shonin especially selected those seven who are, who especially appreciated the teaching of Amida Buddha, who developed the teaching of, you know, uh, Amida Buddha or Nembu's teaching. So among many, uh, you know, the uh, uh, masters. So he especially picked those people. So by the way, I think I put that, some, some of you notice Shakamuni Buddha, you know, not that 2,500 2, years BC, it's just 500, 600 BC. Sorry, I, I put the wrong number, that uh, Shakamuni Buddha's birth year. And then who are they? So there are uh, Shinran Shorin selected especially seven masters between, you know, uh, Shakamuni Buddha to him. And then there are two from India, Nagarjuna and then Vasubandhu. And then three from China, Tonglang, Daozhou, and then Shandao. And then two uh, from Japan, Genshin and then Hone. Sometimes we call Genku. So three different regions, and then you can see the kind of difference of you know time, century too. So because of that, Shinran Shonin could receive the teaching of Amida Buddha. Shinran Shonin could appreciate the Nembu's teaching or Amida Buddha's wisdom and the compassion. So they are very, very important. Then this is a very traditional ne, onaiji altar of Jodo Shinshu temple. So we usually have, you know, five uh, objects of worship in the in, enshrine in the onaiji. So we enshrine Amida Buddha at the center. Ne, at, this is a Jodo Shinshu center uh, onaiji. Ne, Amida Buddha uh, is enshrined at the center. And then facing the Onaijin, the right side is Shinran Shoni, the founder of our school, Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, Shinran Shoni, facing to the Onaijin, is enshrined on the right side. And then next to facing the Onaijin, next to Amida Buddha uh, to the left is uh, Renya Shoni. He is the eighth uh, spiritual leader, abbot of Jodo Shinshu tradition. And then sometimes he is called like a second founder kind of founder. So he's very you know, innovative guy, innovative person. And then he did many, many different things. And then that's how Jodo Shinshu became the, like a nationwide uh, Buddhist organization in Japan, which is the country of Buddhism. And then on the right side, yeah, Prince Shotoku. Shinran Shonin received a lot of influence from Prince Shotoku. He, Shinran Shonin composed many hymns about uh, Prince Shotoku. And then actually he is the one uh, who kind of strongly pushed the like uh, bringing, importing uh, Buddhism to Japan. So because of him, you know, Buddhism started in Japan. So that's why Prince Shotoku is a very, very important figure in the Japanese Buddhist history. And then left side, uh, that is seven masters, yeah, seven masters scroll. So next time when you have a chance to visit your temple and then well, you can you know, take a close look at your uh, Onaijin, Onaijin altar, and then you can find a scroll of seven masters. But I know some temples, like my temple, Barker Buddhist Temple, and then, you know, Marine uh, Buddhist Temple, uh, because of the space, we don't have uh, seven masters. But uh, many temples I have, I think you have this uh, kind of set of Onaiji altar.
But to me, this is how Jodo Shinshu Buddhism or Shinran Shonin thought is structured. So Shinran Shonin, I think he's a kind of genius or you know, very, very important uh, figure in Japanese Buddhism or maybe in the history of Buddhism. But he didn't make up new teaching. He just revealed carefully he read the scriptures and then appreciated the teachings of masters. And then from there, he kind of discovered or elaborated the very important teaching of Amida Buddha. And then to do so, I would say, so three Purana Sutras and then teachings of seven masters kind of ground foundation of Shinran Shonin thought. So in other words, to study Jodo Shinshu Buddhism or to have better understanding of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, it is very important to know the teaching of Three Pure and the Sutras. Right? I think uh, I gave a lecture before uh, on this uh, for this CBE event. So if you you know go to the CBE uh, YouTube channel, then you can find the uh, uh, the lecture uh, uh, session for the teaching of Three Pure and the Sutras. And also there are many wonderful. Right? Uh, teach, uh, lectures by Matsumoto Sensei, Miyazhi Sensei, and Mutsumi Pandura Sensei. So one side is, uh, you know, one thing is uh, Three Pure and the Sutras. And then the other important segment is Seven Masters teaching. So based on those two, well, those teachings, you know, Shinran Shonin kind of established the teaching of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. They are very, very important. So if you go to IBS, we, ma, I used to teach the, uh, those classes. Yeah. So three hour lecture, kinda. so uh, that is a Monday morning. So uh, from kind of 9.30 to you know, 12.30 for three hours, I think there are 14 lectures. And then that's how we covered the teaching of Three Pure and the Sutras and then Seven Masters. And then, of course, that is not enough to cover kind of details of their teachings. Their teaching is very deep, very profound. And then, yeah, even in Japan, so one semester, we just focus on one master. And then still, we need more time to, you know, have a better, deeper understanding of seven masters. And then today, uh, I only, ha only have about 40 minutes left. But, uh, and then I'm going to, you know, cover the teaching of seven masters in the next 40, you know, minutes. So, you know, this is really difficult, you know, to cover the details of the teachings of seven masters. But uh, so today I am going to like uh, maybe one topic, one master. Each master uh, contributed, developed many, you know, uh, different uh, important teachings, especially for the uh, Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, but uh, uh, due to the kind of you know limit limitation of the time, I am going to just focus on uh, one topic, one master, and briefly, yeah, briefly. So if you want to know more, please come to IBS. Yeah. So IBS is a, such a wonderful school, and then now we have an online education. And so if you want to know more about seven masters or the teaching of three pure and sutras, you know, you could also attend, uh, uh, come to the IBS to learn more. Okay, so then I am going to start uh, Nagarjuna. So this is a basic idea of Buddhism. We call it ma, three essentials of Buddhism, ne, sampo in Japanese. So teaching, practice, enlightenment, or uh, Buddhahood. Right? So this is a basic structure of Buddhism. So based on that teaching, it's a kind of signboard direction. And then we practitioner follow the direction and they take action and then try to reach our goal destination. 
right? And then so one goal, right? as I as I said, you know, although there are many different gates, eighty four thousand Dharma gates, different gates, but that we are heading for the same destination to become a Buddha or liberation from the life of suffering in samsara. And then various teachings and then various practice. Now let me just focus on the practice. Yeah, practice. There are many different schools of Buddhism, and then each school or lineage tradition has a different practice or practices. And speaking of Buddhist practices, there are various kinds of practice, so many different kinds of Buddhist practices. And some practice, we practitioners, you know, spend like a, you know, week or months or years, decades, or maybe even like a, or many lifetimes or many kalpas. And then also Nagarjuna, the first master Nagarjuna pointed out, you know, if, you know, as we uh, continue the Buddhist practice, maybe sometimes practitioners, they fall into the danger of nihilistic view, like uh, emptiness, you know, so emptiness kind of always kind of have a danger of uh, becoming kind of nihilistic view. Also, if everything is empty, how come I do this practice? If everything is empty, you know, no meaning to accumulate, generate, uh, uh, you know, merit. So kind of uh, some practitioners fall into the uh, kind of, you know, dangerous as aspect of nihilistic view. Right? So on the other hand, there are some simple, easy practice, a Buddhist practice. For example, the recitation, reciting Amida Buddha's name, saying Nama Amida Buddha, Nama Amida Buddha, Nama Amida Buddha. This is very simple, easy. Wherever we are, whenever we are, we can practice this Nembutsu recitation. So according to Nagarjuna, he as a master of Buddhism, so he kind of you know, categorize Buddhist practice, or oh, this is difficult practice, and this is easy, simple practice. And his recommendation was Nembutsu practice, this easy and simple practice. So this is one kind of, you know, Nagarjuna's contribution to the teaching of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. In other words, Shin and Shonin kind of adopted, you know, follow this Shin, uh, Nagarjuna's recommendation. Okay, so let's follow the simple, easy practice of recitation, Nembut practice. And then, but I want to go a little bit, you know, another you know, step when we look at the easy path versus difficult path. Is it just, you know, uh, encouraging easy or maybe kind of laziness, you know? So, but, I would say Nagarjuna, you know, he kind of questioning, you know, can we, can I, né, successfully or really complete all those Buddhist practices, right? So again, there are many different practices. Some are very difficult and then time consuming, right? We need a patient. And then some uh, practices has to be kind of, we need a certain conditions, right? And then can we really successfully, you know, complete, accomplish all those practices? And then I think his message in this teaching of easy practice is please know yourself. Please know yourself. And then uh, select, you know, suitable or appropriate path for you, right? Each of us live a different life different situation and the different ability, capability, right? And then please know yourself and then make a choice of Buddhist path, right? So I think this kind of accords with Shakyamuni Buddha's message, kind of know yourself, right? 
So in the in selecting choosing a Buddhist path, I think this easy path, difficult path, kind of encouraging you know look into ourselves. So this is a kind of uh, one point of you know easy path and a difficult path in the teaching of Nagarjuna. So that is kind of uh, just one focus of uh, Nagarjuna's teaching. Okay. And then the second master, Basvandu, Seshin Bosatsu in Japanese, okay. or Tenjin Bosatsu. Okay. So he has a kind of interesting with two names. Mashina Shoni also talks about you know, those two names in his writing too. But in the, uh, and he's a great master of you know mind uh, mind only school then yuishiki in japanese then mind only school and then uh, according to the jodo shinshu understanding basbandu is also you know the pure and buddhist he had the aspiration to attain birth in the pure and so basbandu he wrote treatise on the pure and in Japanese, we call it Jodoro. And uh, this treatise begin with this kind of passage. Seson gai shin kimi o jin jippo muge ko nyorai ganshou an la koku. So sometimes we use this, you know, four line uh, short passage for the ekoku. At the temple, we have a sutra chanting, right? And then after sutra chanting, we have a six time nembutsu, namami dabutsu, namami dabutsu. And then after that, we usually have a ekoku. Usually we use ganishi kudoku, byodo se isai, dohotsu bodai shin, ojo an raku. But sometimes we use this basbandu's uh, passage for ekoku too. And then here he said, O oh, world honored one, with the mind that is single, I take refuge in the Tathagata of unhindered light, fearing the ten quarters and aspire to be born in the land of happiness. So it is said this Vasubandhu's treatise on the Pure Land is a kind of first commentary of the larger sutra, which is a sutra scripture uh, describes, explains uh, Amida Buddha in detail. Right, larger sutra, and then which is uh, one of the most important sutra scripture for pure and Buddhist. And it is said, Basvandu's treatise, this treatise on the uh, pure and is the kind of first commentary of the larger sutra. And then this commentary, he begins, you know, he declares this, you know, I take re with the mind that is single, I take refuge in Tathagata of unhindered life, which is Amida Buddha. Different name of Amida Buddha. So this great, you know, Bodhisattva figure, great thinker of Buddhism, he showed kind of his aspiration to, you know, attain birth in the Pure Land, and then refuge in Amida Buddha. And then Shinra Shonin said, right, "So what's this, you know, mind that is single?" In Japanese, ishin, one single mind. What's this? So this is a, a one of Shinran Shonin's interpretation, understanding. So mind that is single, ishin, is to be without doubt or doubt, uh, double-mindedness concerning the words of the world owner and the master of the teaching. This is none other than true te uh, true shinjin. So in the Jodo Shinshu tradition, of course, Basbandu has a lot of doctrinal, you know, uh, important points. But uh, if I pick one thing, or maybe if you go to Tokudo, yeah. when you go to Tokudo ordination, you have to be familiar with the teaching of seven masters. And then this is a kind of one uh, important topic, doctrinal contribution or importance of Vasubandhu in the Jodo Shinshu teaching. It's kind of ishim, mind that is single. That is a kind of core idea of Shinjin, which is most important thing in the Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. 
So this Shinjin, the kind of core essence of Shinjin comes from bus band. That is the importance of my well, doctrinal importance of Basvandu in the uh, Jodo Shinshu tradition. Then let me uh, move on to the uh, next master, which is Danla, ne? Danla. So this is a picture or a slide that I used for Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna categorized, you know, sorted Buddhist practices, the difficult paths and the easy paths. And then Nagarjuna recommended, so easy practice of Nembutsu. And then Tanlam, he has a book, the commentary on the treatise of the Puran. Danlan, he kind of uh, followed the teaching of Basbandu, and then he wrote a commentary of Basbandu's treatise. And then at the very beginning, he kind of uh, quote both two figures, Nagarjuna and then Basbandu. And then at the beginning of his commentary, Tanlan, he kind of raised a question, how come this you know, simple, easy practice of Nembutsu is enough? for me to attain birth in the Puran and to attain Buddhahood there. So according to our understanding, the more complicated, the longer practice would be better. We can generate more uh, merit. And then maybe easy, simple practice, nah, not so good, right? not so valuable. But how come, you know, Nagarjuna said this easy, simple practice is enough? So that is a question of Tanla, and that's how he developed his discussion. He kind of dive into the, this ease or simplicity of Nembu's recitation, and then developed his you know, philosophical discussion. So again, this is the uh, kind of idea of a Buddhist practice. There is a teaching direction, and then we practitioner follow this direction, take action, and then uh, make progress heading towards our destination. Okay. So let me use this. You see a kind of map of California. But since I'm in the Bay Area, so say uh, if I want to go to San Diego, so San Diego is my destination. How do I get there? How do I get there? So we can take an airplane, you know, we can fly to San Diego or maybe Greyhound uh, long distance bus or my cruise ship, you know, and then or Amtrak, you know, and then or a bicycle. And then this, you know, this illustration is we could walk to San Diego too technically speaking, if, if we are healthy enough, right? And then uh, some of you notice this Uber, right? I don't know how much it will cost, but uh, you know, technically we can have like a door-to-door -door service by Uber, you know, from San Francisco to San Diego. So one destination, there are many, you know, different options, choice, of you know way to get there and then looking at those you know options maybe you know taking a flight train long distance bus uber so maybe those are the kind of ways me to be carried to the destination right drivers pilot you know take us take me to the destination and then how about this yeah, so walk down to all the way to San Diego or, you know, uh, bicycle yeah, all the way down to uh, San Diego. So this is more like a, a self effort to get there. So maybe we could adopt this idea when we walk or make progress of the uh, Buddhist path.
So our destination is to become a, a Buddha or enlightenment, uh, liberation from this life, life in samsara. And then how, we, how can we achieve that uh, goal? How do we get there? So maybe one side is we, as a practitioner, make efforts, kind of self, you know, power practice. And then on the other hand, there is another way, approach, you know, supported, helped by Buddha's power, Buddha's effort, which is called other power. So Dhanlan, he started his discussion, how come this easy practice of Nembutsu is enough? And then his discussion kind of uh, directed to, went to the uh, focusing on, you know, Buddha's support, Buddha's effort. Because Buddha's support efforts, that's why I can make it. So that's why this simple practice is enough, not my effort. And then he further, Talan further developed discussion and then focusing on the virtuous power of Amida Buddha's, you know, name, Namo Amida Buddha. So Buddha's power kind of encapsulated into this short phrase, Namo Amida Buddha. So this is kind of uh, Talan's kind of conclusion, right? Because of Buddha's power, and then this, you know, Buddha's virtue, merit, is kind of encapsulated in this short phrase. So that's why not our, you know, efforts, our self-power practice, but the, because thanks to Buddha's power supports efforts. So that's why we can make it even, you know, practice. Nembutsu is simple and easy. So this is Danlan's uh, contribution to the teaching of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism like a self power and the other power. Dhanlan, he focused through the you know, uh, easy and the simple practice of Nembutsu, he discovered Buddha's support, Buddha's effort directed to us. So that is Dhanlan's contribution to the Jodo Shinshu teaching. Gomenasai, <laughs> yeah, I forgot to click on this. Yeah. So this is uh, Donald's uh, recommendation. So now let me move on to the fourth uh, master, Daocho, in Japanese we call Dosha. Yeah. Then uh, he looked into, he also had a kind of question, can we really attain Buddhahood during this lifetime or maybe with this, you know, human body? Right. So it's really tough to difficult, not easy to attain enlightenment to become a Buddha. But there are many serious, you know, practitioners, seekers, uh, for the uh, enlightenment to become a Buddha. And the many Buddhist practitioners had a kind of struggle. Am I really, you know, making progress towards the goal of destination? And then such question came from this kind of reflection or observation. So Tao Chou, he lived in the uh, sixth century in China. And then there is a big disruption, uh, uh, oppression, persecution of Buddhism in China, sixth century. And then Tao Chou, he witnessed kind of disruption or decline of Buddhism. And he wondered, is this a kind of right time, right place for me to you know, devote myself to Buddhist practice. And then, of course, the societies, you know, there are many, you know, groups, countries, regions fight each other. And then natural disasters. And so, so that's why people die, you know, famine or wars. So unstable society. 
And then, but the, as a Buddhist practitioner, he needed to focus on Buddhist practice. So he kind of wondered, am I really, is this a really a right time for me to pursue search for the enlightenment? And then, you know, even when those circumstances is not so good, if the practitioner is capable enough, the person can make it. But uh, I'm sure he was kind of so distracted, got so nervous. Right? So he wondered, am I really okay to you know, continue pursue Buddhist practice here and now? And then there is another you know, factor, teaching factor is a uh, last Dharma age. So this is the one idea of kind of decline of uh, Buddhist teachings in the human history. But today I'm not going to go into this, uh, the explanation of last Dharma age. Now, you know, everybody, you are on the, you know, computer. So you just Google, you know, last Dharma age, then you can get the, you know, uh, nice, uh, explanation could be much better than my explanation on the, you know, internet. Maybe Google Sensei teach you that provides you a good answer of the last Dharma age. So he witnessed, as a serious seeker, he witnessed decline of the Buddhism. And then as a serious seeker Buddhist practitioner, he wondered the situation. Yeah. And then from there, he carefully kind of look into or uh, observe Buddhist practice or Buddhist path. And then he kind of categorized Buddhist teachings into Path of Sage and then Pure on the Way. So Path of Sages is a kind of teaching or Buddhist path in which people or practitioners try to attain Buddhahood in this world during this lifetime. Of course, it's not easy, right? So many distractions in this world. And then to become a Buddha, we need to eliminate, completely eliminate three poisons, which are the causes of our suffering. Right? So to become a Buddha, to attain enlightenment, is kind of to be completely liberated from suffering. So in other words, we need to eliminate the cause of our suffering. And then in this, you know, distracting world, we need to focus on Buddhist practice. So this is a possible stage. And then another path to attain Buddhahood enlightenment is pure and way. So attain kind of this liberating, being liberated from this samsara, life of suffering, and then attain nirvana, enter into the realm of nirvana. And there we become a Buddha. So Tao Cho, his recommendation was yeah, pure and way. For him, especially for him, maybe other you know, masters, other sages, practitioners, you know, they may they could you know make it. But uh, I myself, Tao Cho, he thought I cannot make it. So that's why I need to attain birth in the pure. Yeah. But this is not the uh, escapism not just escaping the difficulties of this world. But I would say my, my take, my understanding is he was very realist when they honestly, humbly or candidly reflect upon, observe the reality of this world and then my capability, ability as a Buddhist practitioner. It's really difficult to attain, to make it in this world following the path of sage. And then so other masters like a Shandao, Honen Shonin, Shinran Shonin, right? Not just escaping the difficulties of making it, you know, in this world, but the more realistically, humbly or honestly look into themselves and then observe the reality of this Saha world. And then that observation reflection drove them to choose the path of uh, pure and way. So, you know, Nagarjuna, I said, you know, when you pick up, choose Buddhist path, please know yourself. I think that's along with, you know, that the Nagarjuna's message too. 
it's not just blindly pick or take Buddhist path, kind of based upon honest and then kind of a uh, very critical reflection. And then that's how those Pyrrhon masters selected Pyrrhon way. So in the Jodo Shinshu tradition, Tao Cho's contribution is this Pyrrhon way in the past of the sages. And then he recommended Pyrrhon way. Then the next master is the fifth master is Shandao. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, slide number, maybe the slide number seven, yeah. seven or eight or number five. Yeah. If you check the like a birth year and the death year of the those masters, only Taocho and Shandao overlap. So Shandao, he could receive the guidance directly from Tao Cho. So that's why Shandao received a, a highly influenced the teaching of you know, Pure and Buddhism from uh, Tao Cho. And then as a Pure and uh, practitioner, he thought, he questioned, how can I be born in the Pure and then attain Buddhahood? And then, his selection was Nembutsu, ne? Nembutsu recitation, following the Nagarjuna and then Danlan's you know, recommendation. Among many different you know, Puran uh, practices, he kind of exclusively selected, picked the uh, Nembutsu recitation practice. So he was kind of advocator of Nembutsu recitation. He kind of started, initiated a big movement of Nembutsu recitation. Before, Nembutsu is more like a meditative practice, sitting down and then contemplate or kind of meditated Buddha's you know, uh, appearance. But as Shandao, he started a big movement of recitation of Nembutsu. So kind of the legend said, as Shandao recited Nembutsu, Namami Dabutsu, Namami Dabutsu, it is said his words of Nembutsu became like a Amida Buddha, Buddha. So this picture is a little bit, you know, hard to look, but there are some, you know, Buddha's image around, the, you know, out of uh, his mouth. Then as a Nembutsu advocator, Shandao, he developed the kind of essence or importance of this Nembutsu recitation practice. So to explain that, let me use this. So now you see the uh, image of a uh, vaccine on the screen, right? Yeah. So, and I put the question, what do you see? Yeah. So you'd say, yeah, since I can see that, you know, like a small, you know, uh, bottle of uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And then let me ask, what else? What else do you see? Needle? <laughs> yeah. So this is a kind of small dose, small amount of liquid, right? But uh, for humans, for us to get this, you know, liquid, so many people made a great effort, right? Like uh, uh, researchers, doctors, and the pharmacists, and then politicians, and so many people made a great, huge, you know, tremendous efforts to get this vaccination. So it's a small, you know, doors, small liquid, but uh, there are kind of invisible, you know, uh, factors, things behind this, you know, small amount of liquid. And it is kind of hope to defeat the disease, right? Physically, it is just a small amount of liquid. But uh, if we have a, like a different eyes, different first perspectives, we can see something else, right? And I would say this is the most important thing, especially for pure and the Buddhists. 
in the pure and the Buddhism, so many symbols or things or images. Sometimes people say, oh, it's just an imaginary story. Uh, pure and the Buddhism is just a fairy tale. No. So the point of pure and the Buddhism is we are kind of challenged, right? We need to go beyond or look into those symbols and then discover what's essence, what's in there, right? So this is very, very important thing for pure and the Buddhism. So then, how about this Namo Amida Buddha? Just a six uh, Chinese combination of six Chinese characters. It's short phrase, Namo Amida Buddha. It's very short practice and a kind of simple practice. But according to Shandao, his understanding, his discussion is, although it is a short phrase, just a combination of just six Chinese characters, but it is, you know, Amida Buddha encapsulated huge innumerable merits into this, you know, short phrase, short word, for our sake, right? For us to easy, readily to practice, recite. So in other words, this short phrase is a kind of manifestation or kind of different style form of Amida Buddha's deep compassion, aspiration to liberate us from this samsara, right? By reciting this Namo Amida Buddha, Namo Amida Buddha, we can be liberated from this samsara and then attain Nirvana, enlightenment. That is Nembut's past, Nembut's practice. Right? So in other words, we need to discover, listen, this profundity in this simple short phrase. Right? And then we need to discover the formless Amida Buddha's compassion wisdom in this, you know, complete, you know, six Chinese character. In the Jodo Shinshu tradition, eh, sometimes I, you know, get a question, Sensei, what is the, you know, practice of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism? Of course, it is Nembutsu recitation, but at the same time, it's a, to listen to the Dharma, to deeply, truly listen to the teaching. And then what, sh we, what you know, we should listen. We should listen all those kind of profundity or complexity in the, this simple practice of Nembutsu. That is what we should listen when we, you know, in the Jodo Shinshu tradition. So this is Shanda's contribution, right? It is a simple practice, but that there's a very deep, profound, something very, you know, uh, complex within this short phrase. And then that's how Shandao kind of uh, encouraged people to recite this, you know, Nembutsu uh, recitation. Hi. And then from now, I am going to talk about the two masters in Japan, Genshin and the Genku or Honen. Uh, so Genshin, yeah, uh, so I always, even when I taught, uh, uh, you know, uh, teaching yeah, at the IBS, yeah, always uh, having a hard time to uh, talk about the Genshin. Yeah, because, yeah ma, so today I'm going to share one episode about him. Yeah. So Shinra, uh, like, uh, he took ordination at the age of nine, which is like a, a Shinran Shon. Yeah. The founder Shinran Shoni, he became a, a monk at the Tendai Mount here at the age of nine. Same way, Genshin, at the very early age, he became a Buddhist monk. And then, interestingly, you know, six years later, he received appointment from emperor to give a lecture on Buddhist scriptures, which is kind of very, you know, unusual thing. In other words, he's very, you know, smart guy. Yeah. So that's why he kind of get the invitation from the emperor to give a lecture to him. Then, you know, after giving a lecture to the emperor, I I'm sure emperor kind of were really, you know, uh, happy or appreciated wonderful lecture by Genshin. So that's why he received kind of reward, the fabrics. And the Genshin was so happy. 
And then he wanted to let the, his mother know, hey, mom, I got this, you know, I made this. So he kind of sent the fabrics to his mom. But to his surprise, then his mother returned them and then wrote to him, he didn't want him to be a monk seeking after fame and the better social status. So such a wonderful mom. Yeah. And then since then, he secluded himself in the monastery in the Yoka, which is kind of far back, far kind of uh, back of the mount here. And he just dedicated himself to the scholarship. So this is a kind of you know personal. And then my, I just introduced the story of Genshin, but the, each of the seven masters have a very unique, interesting stories and episodes. Although I didn't share them with you, but this is a one story about the Genshin. And then another interesting thing about the Genshin is my, he wrote the essentials for attaining birth, uh, Ojo Yoshu in Japanese at the age of 44. And then in those days, uh, China still have a kind of prestige or a kind of you know very uh, advanced country of Buddhism compared with Japan. But uh, uh, interestingly, Genshin's work, Essentials for Attaining Birth, kind of imported, exported to China, and then Chinese people really you know praised this work and then this is a kind of really uh, unusual thing in kind of in the history of Japan so my those information you know provides us you know how you know a wonderful Buddhist monk scholarly monk he was and then also the uh, Ojo Yoshu essentials of attaining birth uh, at the beginning we can see like a very detailed descriptions of hell that's why later uh, only a part of this hell portion kind of uh, in the especially Edo period there are many like uh, illustrations kind of published to based on the information of uh, Genshin's essentials for birth attaining birth So Genshin's doctrinal contribution to Jodo Shinshu teaching or Shinran Shonin thought, maybe a recommendation of Nembutsu in terms of birth in the Pure Land. So again, in the Pure Land Buddhist tradition, man, still there are many different kinds of practice. But uh, uh, according to Genshin's understanding, those who engage in their uh you know practices you know other than nembutsu maybe attain birth in the transformed land kind of marginal né, uh, place of a uh, uh, pure and then those who practice nembutsu dedicate themselves to nembutsu practice can attain birth in the fulfilled uh, pure land, which is kind of a center or the land fulfilled or maybe accord with amida buddha's wish so that's why uh, Genshin, he recommended uh, Nembut's practice so that more people can attain birth in the fulfilled pure with this Nembut's practice. I know it's already noon and I already talked 60 minutes, but uh, uh, let me uh, continue and then talk about the last uh, master, uh, Honen Shonin or Genku. Sorry, I, I forgot to put the... Uh, caption so the left side black and white image that is whole nation that is whole nation so shina shonin said so this is a quote from tanisho a record in lament of divergences he said i simply accept and trust myself to what my revered teacher who is whole shonin told me just say the name butsu and be saved by amida And then Honen Shoni himself said, saying the name unfailingly brings about birth, for this is based on Buddha's primal vow. And it is said, Honen Shoni, he recited Nembutsu 60,000 60, times a day. 
This is kind of huge, yeah, 60,000 times a day. Almost no time to sleep. So Shinran Shonin, as a follower, disciple of Honen Shonin, yeah, Shinran Shonin, after 20 year practice life as a Tendai monk, he left Mount Hie and then he joined the Honen Shonin's group. And then he absorbed, you know, listened to the teaching of Nembutsu and then dedicated himself to spread the Nembutsu teaching, you know, left of his life. So Shinra Shonin, the teaching what he received is, uh, you know, Seida Nembutsu, Seiza Nembutsu, and appreciate Amida Buddha's primal vow. And then Honen Shonin himself, he received the uh, uh, influence from many different Purand masters, but especially he relied on the teaching uh, based himself on the teaching of Shandao. So that's why he kind of strongly pushed reciting the name Butsu. So this is a next slide from the Shandao or Danla. It's a short phrase, but uh, in this short phrase, there is something deep, something you know profound in it. So this is a Ma Buddhist practice, right? Some are very simple, short, or maybe just one single practice. On the other hand, there are some complicated you know, practice takes a long time or needs to do this and that, like a combining different, you know, practices. So speaking of Buddhist practice, there is a kind of spectrum, right? Wide range of Buddhist practice. And then some people may say, oh, simple, short, single practice, eh, maybe, you know, we can generate less merits. So that's why I mean, you no, know, maybe less variable, you know, Buddhist practice, but a complicated and then long, you know, doing, you know, various, you know, combining different practices. Oh, that may, you know, generate more merits. So that's why, you know, those practices should be uh, more variable. So maybe uh, we may look at the Buddhist practice in this way, maybe based on more like a secular. Yeah, maybe kind of our secular idea is something like that. But I think there should be another way to look at the Buddhist practice. Yeah. So simple, short, or just one single practice, I would say less conditions to fulfill. And the complicated, long, various practices, maybe to complete it, to complete them, to accomplish them, we need to fulfill more uh, conditions. Right? When we truly successfully fulfill those conditions, then we can make them, you know, we can complete, accomplish those practices. And then the means, right? More conditions to successfully fulfill means less people can make it. On the other hand, you know, simple, short, single practice with less conditions means more people can make it. And then how about the Nembutsu? Probably among many Buddhist practices, Nembutsu would be the, the easiest and the most simple practice among many other Buddhist practice. So I would say this is a kind of least kind of Buddhist practice, least conditions. The means can accommodate, accept more people, or maybe anybody can make it, or anybody can, you know, successfully accomplish a home this practice. So again, so Buddhist practice, ma, this is one way to look at the Buddhist practice, and especially from Jodo Shinshu perspective, it's not kind of giving a discipline to ourselves, but uh, this is a kind of process for us to be liberated from this samsara and then to become a Buddha, right? 
And then this process in the Jodo Shinshu tradition or Nembutsu practice supported by Amida Buddha. Especially this simplicity, ease of Nembutsu practice is none other than the depth or profundity of Buddha's compassion to embrace, you know, to accept all beings. So that's why Amida Buddha compassionately prepared this easy, simple practice. And then that aspiration is what we call prima va, hongan. So this easy, simple practice is a kind of spirit of Amida Buddha's prima va, this nada than Amida Buddha's deep, deep compassion to embrace all beings. So Honen Shoni and then Shinran Shoni, they, you know, recommended, encouraged to say the name Butsu. But this is not a just kind of say the name Butsu blindly. Yeah. So ideally, our recitation is a kind of expression of, you know, what we have received, but we have appreciated Amida Buddha's benevolence or deep compassion or compassionate aspiration, guidance. Amida Buddha prepared everything for us to make progress toward the kind of revelation from suffering, attainment of Buddhahood, Nirvana, and everything kind of prepared. And then we just received them. And then, you know, when we, we, we receive something, what do we say? Okay, thank you, right? So it's a kind of barbarous expression of appreciation of what we have received. And then this kind of appreciation is we call Shinji. So that's why the Nembutsu recitation in the Jodo Shinshu tradition, or maybe, you know, traditionally speaking, there should be two types of, roughly speaking, two types of uh, Nembutsu. Yeah. So I put the invoice and the receipt. So invoice type of Nembutsu was this. Okay, so Amida Buddha. I've been reciting Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, thousand times a day for 20 years. So please assure my you know, happy life. Please assure my attainment of Nirvana. So this is a kind of you know, requesting something based upon what I've done, like a kind of, I would say, invoice type of name. On the other hand, there is another kind of uh, style form of name Butsu, kind of receipt, receipt type of name Butsu. So we issue receipt to tell, to show what we have received. Right? So we have received, I received many things from Amida Buddha. Because of me, Amida Buddha spent five karpas you know, to think of me. And then like a three treasures, I could encounter this wonderful teaching, Buddha's words of wisdom. And the Buddha always making effort for me to be awakened to this, you know, life reality of this life or who I am. So I've re always received compassionate spiritual guidance from Amida Buddha. And then with this Nembus teaching, I'm sure to attain birth in the pure land, be liberated from the, you know, kind of cycle of uh, in samsara. So I've received many, many things from this Buddha. And then because I've acknowledged, I become aware of what I've received from this Buddha. So that's why the kind of expression of our gratitude for what we have received from this Buddha. So this is the Jodo Shinshu Nembutsu recitation. So uh, today, ma, I, eh, kind of very quickly cover the uh, teachings of seven masters. Yeah. So Nagarjuna, Easy Path, and then Vasubandhu, Mind That Is Cinco, Danlan, Atta Power, Taucho, Pure Land Way, you know, like a Path of Sage, Pure Land Way. Yeah. And then Shandao, Nembutsu, the importance of Nembutsu recitation, Genshin, you know, birth and the Nembutsu recitation. And then Honen Shoni, importance of primal vow, which is a kind of ground of our Nembutsu recitation. So when we look at 
Jodo Shinshu teaching. Né? You can find those things. And then those teachings originally came from those seven masters. And then Shinashoni absorbed and then deeply contemplated, reflected upon those things. And then he kind of built up, kind of, you know, uh, put all things together and then revealed as a Jodo Shinshu teaching. And then that's how Shinran Shonin received the teaching né, of Amida Buddha originated from, delivered by né, Shakamuni Buddha. But that to do so, we did, we did need our three Pyoran Sutras and then seven masters. And then because of them, we can have Jodo Shinshu teaching too. Uh, let, let us, you know, put us hands together in Gashou. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu, Namo Amidabutsu.